It's Saturday, the 13th of November, 1999, in Nagoya City's Nishi Ward. The Takaba family enjoys their Saturday morning breakfast together in apartment 201 of the Kato Corporation's building's second floor. The family consisted of 43-year-old Satoru Takaba, who worked at a real estate office in neighboring Kita Ward, where he met his wife, 32-year-old Namiko, as her superior. The pair had married four years prior, in July of 1995, after which Namiko had stopped working and became a housewife. The couple had a two-year-old son named Koe, who was the center of Namiko's life, as she carefully placed all of the family's memories in photo albums that would keep the memories alive for years to come. That morning, Satori got ready for another day at the office, while Namiko prepared breakfast and cared for their son. The few days prior, Koei hadn't been feeling well and developed a fever, causing Namiko to plan a visit to a nearby pediatric clinic after her husband left for work. Not long after her husband took off around 9am, Namiko and Koei had seemingly left the house only to return at 11am as seen by a resident working on his car in the parking lot. Namiko walked upstairs to the second floor and went inside apartment 201, never to be seen alive again. Somewhere between noon and 1 p.m., neighbors had heard a loud noise as if Namiko was moving furniture, followed shortly after by sounds as if someone ran downstairs. More than an hour later, the landlord's wife stopped by to deliver some fruit, though was surprised to see the door was unlocked. When she peeked inside, Namiko seemed to be down on the floor with her feet in the hallway and her upper body in the living room. On closer inspection, the landlord's wife saw blood around Namiko's body, which extended through the hallway and seemed to have accumulated around the entrance area. Emergency services were immediately called and husband Satoru was notified to come home immediately. Though when paramedics arrived and investigated the body, Namiko was pronounced dead at the scene. When Satoru arrived home, his apartment was filled with a team of emergency service employees. While he initially believed Namiko to have fallen ill based on the phone call he received at work, paramedics soon explained they believed Namiko had died due to unnatural causes. Satoru and other neighbors were forced to wait outside while investigators were called to figure out what happened to Namiko Takaba on that fateful November day in 1999. Investigators entered the apartment and quickly confirmed the suspicions of emergency personnel. The death of Namiko Takaba had been due to unnatural causes. And while police focused on the crime scene, it soon became clear someone other than Namiko had been in the Takaba's home. Based on video footage and photos of the apartment, the following overview of the crime scene is constructed to get a better grasp on what happened. The apartment consisted of an entrance with a hallway leading to the kitchen area, a living room, two tatami rooms, a toilet, and a bathroom. Namiko's body was found three meters from the entrance at the threshold between the living room where her upper body was located and the hallway where her legs were positioned. ま、Namiko was found lying on her abdomen with her head turned to the right, whereas the glasses she'd been wearing seemed to nearly fall off of her head. 
Her left hand was positioned with the palm facing towards the ceiling. She was wearing a sweatshirt and blue jeans, which had not been disturbed as far as police could tell, and the floor surrounding her body was covered in blood. Autopsy results revealed stab wounds in Namiko's neck area, which severed her right carotid artery, explaining the source of the pool of blood that surrounded the victim's body. Defensive wounds were found on either one or both hands, which appeared to be an attempt to block the weapon that had been used. In addition, a lump on the left side of her forehead implied she endured a strike to her face as well. According to the report, Namiko had died about two to three hours before she was found from blood loss due to the stab wounds in her neck. As investigators turned to the apartment for possible clues, the crime scene revealed multiple leads for police to follow up on. A first clue was found at the entrance, which revealed both blood splatters as well as multiple bloody footprints, as if the culprit had been waiting for at least a little while at the entrance before leaving the apartment. <laughs> The footprints belong to a 24 cm sized women's shoe with heel, mass produced in South Korea. Four types of shoes were connected to the sole, of which by 1999, about 7,000 pairs had been shipped to supermarkets and department stores in the northern Kanto and Kyushu area. The following photos show the types of shoes that could be connected to the bloody footprints at the entrance of the apartment. The blood found at the entrance was eventually analyzed and to Satoru's surprise did not belong to his wife. DNA evidence from the blood revealed the culprit to be female and to have blood type B, a blood type found only in roughly 20% of the Japanese population. The culprit's blood indicated that Namiko had somehow injured her assailant during the attack. The trail of blood led investigators from the entrance to the body, though another trail of blood was found leading from the hallway to the bathroom sink. It's believed the culprit tried washing her hands and tend to a wound she had endured during the murder. According to Satori, a forensic scientist who examined the crime scene mentioned that due to the amount of blood, it's likely the culprit's vein was injured, and it was believed the bleeding couldn't have been stopped naturally. In addition to the blood, the family's vacuum cleaner was found in the hallway in front of the entrance, which investigators believed was related to the last activity Namiko had undertaken before getting attacked. Based on the circumstances at the scene, it's believed Namiko was injured in the bathroom, after which she had tried crawling across the hallway into the living room. She had passed away with her body partially located in the living room, which might have been a last attempt to protect her son who was in the kitchen. Investigators made their way into the living room, in which a small TV had allegedly echoed the sounds of the show Varate Itomo, meaning, it's okay to laugh in an otherwise silent apartment. On the kotatsu in front of the TV, a cup of soggy noodles was found from a brand Namiko didn't usually eat. The TV itself was placed on a dark wooden cabinet, which blocked a bigger part of the entrance to the kitchen. A baby gate on the left side of this cabinet remained the only entrance to the kitchen, as the door between the kitchen and hallway was blocked by a smaller cabinet and was probably not used by the Takaba family at the time. Besides miso soup that Koei had left at the breakfast table, the kitchen area showed one particular unexpected clue. On the table where Koei had been found sitting at by the landlord stood a half-empty package of the lactic acid bacteria drink Yakult Mil Mil E. While the top part of the package had a hole in it, the straw didn't seem to be used. Part of the content of the drink had been either spilled or thrown up at the entrance of the apartment, 
As investigators found that the content at the entrance had the same ingredients as the drink on the table. Strangely enough, Satori claimed the family had not previously bought this particular beverage and they had no habit of drinking it. Investigators traced the serial number on the package, reportedly to be QBAG Y14, which revealed it had been produced in Aichi Prefecture, after which it was exclusively sold in Nagoya's Nishimikawa area, more than 30 kilometers southeast of the crime scene. While Namiko could have either bought the drink for herself or gotten it from someone else, this particular flavor was directed towards adults and therefore less likely meant for Koei. Based on this information, investigators hypothesized the culprit brought the beverage to the crime scene, which meant she may have somehow entered the kitchen. Two supposed routes are proposed, assuming the mail mail e package was brought in by the culprit. The first route goes from the hallway through the tatami rooms, and the second route goes from the hallway stepping over Namiko's body into the living room, after which the kitchen could be reached. The problem with both routes is that no blood was reportedly found in either of the tatami rooms or the kitchen, nor was blood reported on the mil mil egg package. Rumors online speculated that it might have been hard to open the package while injured, meaning the culprit might have entered the apartment with seemingly good intentions at first. The remainder of the apartment showed no signs the culprit had gone through any of the belongings, and as far as investigators were aware, Nothing had been taken from the Takaba home. The murder weapon, however, was never found and may have been brought in by the culprit herself. The two-year-old son was found sitting unharmed at the kitchen table, playing quietly with his toys. Based on his position, Koei had likely seen his mother get killed in front of his own eyes. At three years old, one year after the murder, Koei had apparently said, Mom was fighting with a woman I didn't know and died as can be seen in the following home video. A year after his statement, Koei had returned to the crime scene as a four-year-old and even mentioned, the culprit is the woman from the convenience store. Satoru was surprised and immediately notified police, who involved counselors to try to get the true meaning behind his statement. In the end, Koei's eyewitness testimony could not be reliably confirmed. After becoming an adult, Koei had mentioned that he has no recollection of what happened. A question that remained unanswered is how the culprit could have entered the house. No signs of forced entry were found, and Namika was known to lock the door and be careful of who she opened the door for. It's said that she would check who was at the door either by checking through the kitchen window and otherwise by using the people at the door. Knowing whether or not the culprit was known to the Takaba family could help in understanding what happened and in finding who the culprit was. In order to answer these questions, police expanded their investigation to not only apartment 201, but the surrounding area as well. After supposedly waiting for a short while based on the blood splatters at the entrance, the culprit may have waited for the right time to leave the apartment without being noticed. Neighbors had then heard the culprit run down the stairs after hearing a loud noise coming from the Takaba apartment. When the exterior of the apartment was analyzed, investigators noticed blood in the hallway, stairs and parking lot next to the building. According to former member of Aichi Prefecture's police's first investigative division, Eitoku Okabe, drops of blood were found in intervals of a few meters zigzagging through the neighborhood, which made it possible to follow the culprit's fleeing route. While keeping in mind that some buildings have been taken down and others have been constructed during the years after the murder, let's follow the path the culprit took and analyze the options of where she could have gone to. 
高場さんは犯人が逃げたとみられる経路を案内してくれましたそこの階段からずっとですねあの血がポツッポツッとまあ小さなあの血の一滴一滴なんですけどずっとこの辺までついてまして。After the culprit came down the stairs of the apartment building on the north side, she seemed to have fled on foot and immediately took a left turn. While in recent Google Street View images, more buildings can be seen. At the time of the murder, the area used to be a parking lot, as can be seen in the following older footage. Shortly after, at the T junction, she took a right turn in the direction of the Shonai River, moving further up north. After walking to the end of the street, She took a left turn, quickly followed by a right turn, zigzagging through the back streets of Nagoya's Nishi Ward. After passing on Shoji Temple, the culprit took a right turn again, quickly followed by a left turn, moving even further up north. After turning right at the first intersection the culprit saw, she again walked until the end of the street. It should be noted that while the culprit zigzagged through the neighborhood, She could have picked a shorter route. While she could have picked an indirect route to throw off investigators, some have speculated she may not have been from the area and wandered around the neighborhood without knowing where to run to. After arriving at the next T junction, a left turn was made, passing Myohonji Temple to the stairs leading further up north. After climbing the stairs, the culprit is believed to cross the street into Ino Park. After walking about 500 meters from the crime scene, the water tap located in the park was believed to be used by the culprit to tend to her injuries once more, as blood had been found around the tap as well. In addition, it seemed there were also traces of her wandering around the park. When Satoru was asked about Namiko's possible relation with Ino Park, he replied, It seemed that Namiko had been to Ino Park two or three times, but it didn't feel right. After the culprit stayed in Ino Park for a short while, she seemed to have continued following the southeast border of the park, eventually taking a right turn to the east. At this point, the supposed culprit was spotted by a female eyewitness at 12 15 pm. The following sketch, based on eyewitness testimonies, had initially been released with a blurred out face. According to the eyewitness testimonies, It concerned a woman of around 40 to 50 years old, with a length of about 160 centimeters, and black hair that seemed to be in a perm, reaching her shoulders. While the first eyewitness looked in the direction of Ino Park from the east side, the woman walked towards her direction on the opposite side of the road from the park. The witness remembered being surprised as the suspect was holding her left hand with her right hand in a very bloody piece of cloth against her chest. Based on this observation, it's most likely the suspect had injured her left hand during the scuffle she may have had with Namiko. While the suspect slowly walked along the road, her face seemed to be frowning as if she was in pain. About 10 meters from the spot the suspect was seen, somewhere along the north side of the 6 NTT Company housing complex, investigators could no longer trace the trail of blood. Investigator Okabe, Told Tokai TV at the time, I couldn't see drips of blood in this area. I don't know if they couldn't find it or if it wasn't there in reality. According to several officers connected to the case, police used two dogs to try to pick up the trail of blood the night Namiko was murdered, who managed to follow traces up until Ino Park. Though at the same time, some media outlets allegedly began following the bloodstains. Which resulted in police temporarily suspending the investigation of the blood traces. According to some sources, the night after suspending the investigation into the blood trail of the culprit, it had supposedly rained, which washed away all traces that could have been left. One investigator said that if they could have followed the blood trail without interruption, they might have caught the culprit. However, according to data from the Japan Meteorological Agency, It had not rained on the 13th of November. The only two days where significant rain was reported that month after the incident were on the 15th and the 24th. And while two days after the incident, some rain was reported, it had mainly been in the afternoon and not during the night. Which begs the question 
which rain allegedly caused the traces of blood to disappear. As blood had been found until the road alongside Eno Park, police looked into the nearby NTT company housing complex, though did not find their suspect. Somewhere around 2007, the NTT housing complex was torn down and new buildings were completed as of July of 2009 as can be seen on historic Google satellite images. At 12.20 p.m., five minutes after the first eyewitness had seen the supposed culprit, another eyewitness spotted the suspicious woman believed to be the same person as the one seen a few minutes earlier. According to detectives, the male eyewitness had been driving his car next to Shotokuji Temple, about 400 meters from where the first witness had spotted the suspicious woman. The suspect was described similar to as the first eyewitness account and was again seen holding her left hand with her right hand around her chest. The woman was standing at the corner across the street from Shotokuji Temple and initially didn't seem to want to cross, though did so when the eyewitness stopped his car. While the presence of the blood traces beyond the crossing at Eno Park had been controversial, it should be noted that the distance between the first and second eyewitness was about 400 meters, which is about a five minute walk, making it possible it concerned the same witness that had been seen a few minutes earlier at Eno Park. Unfortunately, the second eyewitness is the last person to have reportedly seen the suspected killer in public. Online, several theories about the culprit's escape route have been proposed. A first theory proposed the culprit lived nearby. She may have lived close which could explain why the culprit fled on foot and could easily disappear after Shotokuji Temple. It's speculated she lived somewhere around the temple. A specific point of interest is a nearby apartment complex as the building stood just across the street from Shotokuji Temple where the culprit was seen last. Though in the end, investigators never seemed to find a suspect matching the description of the eyewitnesses. In this case, she would have known the neighborhood and probably took the longer route to avoid being seen. An argument against the culprit living nearby would be the Mill Mill E drink that was only sold 30 kilometers from the crime scene. Though whether or not the drink was brought by the culprit stays a mystery. Even if the drink had come from the culprit, there could be multiple explanations why a package from another district would end up in the hands of someone living in the Nishi ward. It's not certain if saliva or fingerprints on the package were tested. A second theory is proposed by Fumihiko Yanagawa in the 2003 book Into the Maze, The Truth of Unsolved Cases. It's speculated the killer either escaped by her own vehicle or was picked up by someone. If she used her own vehicle, why would she park it this far away from the crime scene when there are several other parking spots on her fleeing route? If another person picked her up, some question why the person who picked her up would be waiting more than 500 meters away from the crime scene. If the person who picked her up was an acquaintance who happened to drive by, the acquaintance probably noticed the wound on the suspected killer's hand and possibly would have reported it to the police. A third theory found online is that the culprit used public transportation to escape. It might be less likely the culprit could have used public transportation without being noticed with her bloody hand. In the end, no reports have been made by witnesses in buses or taxis. She didn't seem to go into the direction of a nearby subway station either, as the closest station was Shonaidori Station, exactly in the opposite direction of the route of the suspect. The closest station to the southeast seems to be Kurokawa Station, over 30 minutes away on foot. By pooling all information police received, the following profile of the suspect was established. The culprit is believed to be female, which is confirmed by DNA analysis and supported by eyewitness accounts. At the time of the crime, she was estimated to be between 40 and 50 years old, meaning she would be around 60 to 70 years old 20 years after the crime. The culprit holds blood type B, which is seen in about 20% of the Japanese population. She was described to be around 160 centimeters tall. Her hair was black, reaching up to her shoulders, and a witness had also mentioned her hair was probably held in a perm. 
She wore shoes with a size of 24 centimeters, and either her right or left hand had been injured at the time and thus might hold a scar. Police eventually released the sketch based on the eyewitness accounts in 2015, though initially decided to blur the suspect's face. While well, according to one source, eyewitness testimonies described the woman to have a medium-built tight face with single eyelids. It said that her facial structure was not particularly distinctive and was therefore not reliable recalled by eyewitnesses at the time. Due to the indistinctive facial features, the public could confuse innocent people for the killer, which might cause an influx of invalid suspect information. Either way, in 2020, an official Aichi Prefectural Police poster was eventually released, alongside a sketch of what the culprit may have looked like after 20 years, with and without a mask. The actual reason why the uncensored sketches were only revealed after more than 20 years is unknown. A reward of up to 3 million yen for anyone providing information leading to the culprit was established in February of 2020, incentivizing the public to come forward with more information 20 years after the crime. As of October 2023, 61 pieces of information have been provided under the Special Investigation Reward System for this case. Until now, it's unlikely the culprit has ever been arrested on other charges, since her DNA would have probably matched with her DNA in the police's database. While eyewitnesses seemingly described the same suspect, one notable discrepancy in their stories came up. One eyewitness described the suspect's clothes to be both a black top and black pants, while another eyewitness reported a woman wearing a pink sweater and black pants. Even though it was investigated whether the suspect took some of Namiko's clothing from the crime scene, none of Namiko's clothes were reported to be missing from the apartment. Another noteworthy observation is that none of the eyewitnesses recounts her to have anything like a bag with her while no murder weapon was found at the scene either. Whether she held the murder weapon while fleeing, or if she deposed of it right after the murder, remains a mystery. Some speculated the culprit to have not planned the murder, as she didn't hold any sort of bag, and didn't seem to wear any clothes or items that would have concealed her identity. When Satoru was shown the sketches of the culprit, he reportedly said he couldn't think of anyone in particular. He also added that the sketch might be too specific and that the perpetrator might have changed her hairstyle after the incident. The landlord's wife, who had discovered Namiko's body, thought the face was very nondescriptive and that it could be anyone with shoulder-length hair. Some believe the culprit didn't come outside a lot, since no suspect has ever been found who fit the description as seen on the poster. Others mentioned she may have committed suicide soon after the murder or died from other causes later on, which may have made it hard for investigators to find any information about the suspect. Another possibility is that the killer fled the country, and while her shoes were Korean-made, it's not unusual for Japanese stores to sell Korean-made shoes. In November of 2020, 21 years after the incident, an eyewitness report that had been submitted to investigators in the past was made public. A neighbor who lived in the apartment next to the crime scene gave the following testimony. About a week before the incident, around 8.10 or 8.20 a.m., a woman who resembled the portrait of the perpetrator appeared at the door of the Takaba's apartment. I think she looked similar to the sketch because her eyes looked harsh and her hair was wavy and wild. Now that I think about it, she gave me a bad impression. At the time, I saw her talking to Namiko and when I greeted her, I thought she responded by bowing, but instead she just glared at me. She had a silver case with her, so I thought she was something like a cosmetic salesperson. I remember she placed the silver case in between the front door so that it wouldn't close as she was talking with Namiko. At the time, the woman had allegedly responded with her testimony in a CBC TV interview, though presumably didn't receive permission from police to go public with her testimony until years later. It speculated that she was not allowed to speak about her experience as the information might have not meant anything and making the information public might have caused the innocent people to get in trouble with the media.
Based on information police had gathered from autopsy results, the crime scene, and eyewitness accounts, the following timeline can be constructed of Saturday the 13th of November, 1999. Nine a.m. Husband Satoru worked at a real estate office in a tower apartment building in neighboring Kita Ward, and usually worked from Monday to Saturday. This particular day, he decided to leave at nine a.m. instead of his usual eight thirty a.m. since he planned to go to another job location directly. Namiko had spoken to Satoru about visiting a doctor, as Koei hadn't been feeling well and reportedly had a fever. Namiko also mentioned she was planning to visit the library, though Satoru was under the impression Namiko planned to visit the doctor as soon as he would leave. It's reported that right after Satoru left, Namiko called a 32-year-old mother and friend who lived on the third floor of the same apartment building. The friend's husband had promised to repair the car bumper of the Takaba's new car they had bought a few weeks prior. Based on photos of the crime scene, a red car in the parking lot, likely to be a Toyota Kami, is believed to be the Takaba family's car. Namiko had asked a friend if her husband needed the keys for the repairs, and also mentioned to her friend she would visit the doctor with Koei due to his fever. 9.30 a.m. A delivery man visits the Takaba apartment, though no one seemed to be home. The delivery man placed a note on the door and left. It's assumed Namiko had left the apartment right after calling her friend, as can be backed up by Satoru's story of her preparing to leave. 10.20 and 10.40 a.m. Namiko's friend from the third floor called the Takaba apartment landline twice, though Namiko had not picked up the phone and didn't seem to be home at the time. When she didn't pick up the second phone call, Namiko's friend reportedly thought, is it because the hospital was busy today? Somewhere that morning, at an unknown time, residents reported to hear sounds that sounded like people fighting inside or around the Takaba home. It's unknown when these sounds were heard and if it was actually in or around the Takaba's apartment. 11.10 a.m. Namiko and Koei visit a clinic called Kito Pediatrics as was recorded in the clinic's visitor's record. While the clinic has since been relocated, the 1999 location could be found about 700 meters southeast from the Takaba home, which is a five-minute trip by bicycle. It should be noted that a gap of two hours is unaccounted for between the time Satoru left home and Namiko's recorded visit to the Kito Pediatrics Clinic. Two main theories are proposed as to what happened in the two hours before Namiko's visit to the clinic. A first possibility concerns the fact that Namiko had mentioned that she had planned to visit the library. While possible, it seems going to the library before attending to Koei's fever would be unlike her caring character. In addition, Satoru was under the impression Namiko would visit the clinic right after he would leave. It's also reported that there is no evidence Namiko went to the library that day, as the books she was scheduled to return were still at the Takaba home after Namiko had been killed. It's unclear if Namiko had mentioned the library to her friend on the third floor. A side note is that according to current Google Maps data, no library was on route of Ino Park and all current libraries are at least two kilometers away from the Takaba home. A second proposed possibility is that Namiko had gone to the clinic but noticed it was crowded and decided to come back later. In the meantime, she might have visited a nearby park to wait for the clinic to become less busy. While some proposed Namiko had met the culprit somewhere in these two hours, others claimed it would be strange to bring Koei to a park while he was having a fever. No reports have been submitted of people seeing Namiko at nearby parks. Namiko could have returned home, as the location of the clinic in 1999 was only 700 meters away from the Takaba apartment. By now, the clinic has changed locations, though both the former and new location are in the opposite direction from the crime scene compared to Ino Park, making it less likely Namiko passed the Takaba apartment to visit Ino Park in the two unaccounted hours. Namiko didn't seem to have made any reports to nearby police boxes, so it seems she hadn't been in significant trouble the hours before her murder. 
11.40 a.m. Namiko and Koe return home from the clinic. A male resident living in the same building, who was taking care of his car in the parking lot, noticed Namiko returning, though the two didn't greet each other at the time. This seems to be the last sighting of Namiko alive. The man had been in the parking lot until noon that day and hadn't noticed any suspicious people. At noon, residents reported seeing a suspicious person in the parking lot, though no detailed information about these reports can be found. Between 12 and 1 p.m., a loud noise was heard from the Takaba apartment, which was described as the sound of furniture being moved. Shortly after, footsteps were heard coming from apartment 201, seemingly running downstairs. No screams were reportedly heard by residents. 12.15 p.m. An eyewitness notices the suspect nearby Eno Park with an injured hand. As the route the culprit took would take around 7 to 10 minutes on foot, Namiko could have been killed around noon. 12.20 p.m. Another eyewitness notices the suspicious woman with a bleeding hand nearby Shotokuji Temple. And while police couldn't find evident traces of blood further than the crossing nearby Ino Park, the eyewitness describes the suspect to be very similar as to the woman seen at 12.15 p.m. Between 12.30 and 2 p.m., Namiko's friend from the third floor tried calling her three more times, though again didn't receive a response. Somewhere between 2 and 2.30 p.m., the wife of the landlord had harvested persimmons at home and delivered some of the fruit to each of the building's tenants. When she rang the doorbell of room 201, there was no one answering the door. She decided to visit the two apartments on the third floor before returning to the Takabas apartment once more. The landlord's wife rang the doorbell once more, and when she didn't receive an answer, she allegedly tried hanging the back of persimmons at the doorknob. While doing so, she noticed the door was unlocked. When she looked inside, she saw the feet of a person who had fallen in the hallway together with blood and footprints around the entrance. <laughs> While multiple sources tell various versions of events that transpired in the moments after the landlord's wife discovered Namiko's body, the following is reported. Either the landlord's wife got her husband, or Namiko's friend on the third floor ran over due to the commotion of discovering the body. The landlord's wife noticed Koe playing with his toys at the kitchen table. When she tended to him, she was relieved to learn he was unharmed. The landlord requested emergency services to be called. In addition, Namiko's friend from the third floor called Satoru's office to inform him his wife seemed to have vomited blood and collapsed, adding that they had called emergency services and that he should come home right away. Within 15 minutes of the call, Satoru returned home without thinking it to be a murder case. Even though Namiko had no prior disease history, he reported that an unnatural cause of death was far from his mind. Upon his return home, Satoru noticed his home was crowded with multiple people representing emergency services. Well, at the time, Satoru seemed to think Namiko had suffered from a medical emergency due to some kind of illness. He overheard paramedics say, We need to call forensics. Police officers were called soon after, after which Satoru was forced to wait outside. At 4 p.m., Satoru learns his wife was murdered. When forensic personnel left the crime scene, Satoru asked one of the members of the team what was going on. At this time, Satoru was informed Namiko's neck region sustained stab wounds, which was the first time he learned she had become the victim of a suspected murder. Satoru was then taken to the police station, where he was questioned extensively. It was also determined what Namiko had eaten the evening before and that morning to estimate the time of death from the content of her stomach. (laughs) 
Even though multiple clues were found at the crime scene and the main suspect was seen by at least two eyewitnesses, the identity and motive of the culprit stays unknown. Therefore, multiple theories have been proposed by both investigators as well as citizens as to who is behind the murder of Namiko and why. Let's go over some of the most proposed theories and the arguments for and against each of these motives to get a grasp on what happened to Namiko Takaba. One of the most talked about motives for the murder of Namiko Takaba is the grudge theory. It's speculated that the culprit had some kind of deep grudge against Namiko, either after meeting her shortly before the murder or after knowing her for a longer time. Arguments pointing towards this motive are as follows. There was no evidence the culprit had broken into the apartment and she didn't seem to have gone through the belongings of the family. Also, stabbings as a method of murdering someone are often considered as a more personal way to kill. In the months leading up to the murder, Namiko had done well for herself. She talked fondly about her love life with her husband and mentioned she was happy that her son looked just like her husband. The family had bought a new red car, which was Namiko's dream. In addition, Namiko had always wanted to go to Disneyland and the family had finally taken the trip. At same period, the family was in the process of buying an apartment and moving Namiko's mother back to Nagoya in anticipation of having a second child. She had allegedly mentioned to multiple people how she had been happy, which might have triggered jealousy in someone around her. While Satoru and a majority of sources described Namiko as a family-oriented person with a kind personality who considered others, some had also described her personality as flashy. In mid-February of 2016, Fuji TV aired an episode of a show in which former FBI agents from the US tried to help in unsolved cases in Japan. In the program, investigators focused on the grudge motive, and with that in mind, three of Namiko's friends were interviewed. The friends had said, even though she was compassionate, she had made careless remarks without any bad intent in the past that could have caused misunderstandings. The show had placed the interviews as the face of Namiko that even her husband doesn't know, which resulted in many harsh reactions surrounding Namiko's character. Satoru's younger sister protested against the show by saying Namiko's reputation was damaged by their portrayal, also worrying about Koei's well-being at the time. As a reaction, Fuji TV publicly apologized and said, there were some expressions that lacked consideration when portraying the victim. We apologize to everyone involved. In the end, the program didn't provide any new information that could lead to the culprit. In 2020, journalist Takehide Mizutani wrote an article in Shukan Jose Prime in which Namiko's friends and acquaintances reacted to the program. According to the friends who had appeared in the program, the coverage was biased, with negative aspects being overemphasized and put out of context. They also mentioned the program only aimed for high viewer ratings without actually caring about bringing attention to the case itself. The friends then went on to describe what Namiko was really like. One of Namiko's high school friends said, She was cheerful, efficient, and had good style. It was easy for her boss to like her. A junior colleague had mentioned, Namiko is not the kind of person to be hated. She was good friends with her friends and neighbors, I've never heard of her having trouble with anyone, adding, she also expressed how happy she was to start living in an apartment with her mom, so some might have seen this as bragging. Police investigated connections the Takaba family had, though no suspicious people had appeared on the investigator's radar. One investigator had said that if an acquaintance would hold a grudge, 
You would expect this person to have shown signs, such as portraying the victim in a bad light in front of others. Satoru had said, I was asked many times if there was anyone I could think of, but I couldn't. If I could, I would be the first to tell them. The detective who interviewed me even mentioned that her family had a good reputation. I would never do anything that would cause resentment, absolutely not. The age of the suspect had seemed to be somewhere in between Satoru's and Namiko's mother's age, which makes it less likely the suspect was one of Namiko's friends, as there would be an age difference of more than 10 years. A second motive that is proposed is that the murder of Namiko is a case of mistaken identity, which is based on two observations. One source discusses how at the time, the resident living next door had a surname with a kanji similar to that of the Takaba family. It's proposed that if the culprit was a foreigner, she could have mistakenly entered the wrong apartment and attacked someone she didn't intend to kill. No information has been made public about the neighbor though. A second more complex proposed motive concerned Namiko's mother. In October, just weeks before the incident, Naomiko's mother decided to move back to Nagoya from Hokkaido. Due to her moving, her name was added to the Takabas mailbox in order for her mail to be received in Nagoya. Her name is presumed to be Toshiko Suzuki, as seen on the photo made of the Takabas mailbox. In order to understand this motive, it's important to go back in time to look at Namiko's upbringing. Namiko and her younger sister had lived together with their mother as her parents divorced when she was just in junior high school. Namiko was described as a mom's girl and frequently helped out at the izakaya that her mother was running. After graduating high school and working for several companies, she ended up in the real estate business where she met Satoru, who she married in 1995. A year later, in 1996, Satoru overheard on his car radio that Namiko's mother had been arrested on suspicion of violating the pharmaceutical affairs law. At the time, her mother was living alone in Nagoya City and had worked as a salesperson for a health food company. She had been arrested for allegedly selling soft drinks containing lactic acid bacteria, collagen and other ingredients, claiming the product had medicinal properties such as being effective against cancer. One source claimed over 14,000 of these bottles were sold, and more than 500 million yen had been earned between October and April of the previous year. The company in Nagoya and 15 related locations were searched, and including Namiko's mother, three people were arrested. Upon returning home, Namiko hadn't said anything to Satoru at first, but when pressed, she broke down in tears. Though Namiko hadn't mentioned her mother's arrest to any of her friends, her mother's picture had appeared in a newspaper, making the arrest known to the public. In the end, Namiko's mother was not prosecuted and was released after a few days, after which Namiko and Satoru had picked her up. She then decided to move to her younger daughter in Hokkaido to get away from what she had experienced in Nagoya. Namiko had visited her mother every summer and her son Koei was born in Hokkaido as well. Three years after the incident though, Namiko's mother planned to move back to Nagoya in the upcoming spring season, and together with the Takaba family, purchased a newly built apartment with a 35-year loan. Satori mentioned that 10 days before the murder, Namiko and her mother had visited a preview model of the home and were excited to think about decorating the place. Returning to the mistaken identity theory, it can be noticed that the culprit had possibly taken a Mil Mil E drink package with her, which just like Namiko's mother's sold product contained lactic acid bacteria. Could the culprit have been someone Namiko's mother sold a product to under false pretense? After which something may have happened to one of the culprit's family members. The culprit then could have seen Namiko's mother on the mailbox of the Takaba family, planning to kill her. Since the suspicious woman had been seen by the neighbor a week before, she may have scouted the apartment while pretending to be a salesperson. Upon returning, she could have killed Namiko when she entered the apartment. Up 
Other propositions for a motive online have been discussing the love life of Satoru and Namigo. The couple had married four years earlier, after meeting in the office, and there seemed to be no signs of trouble in their marriage. In fact, the weeks leading up to the murder had been going especially well for the family, and Namiko had repeatedly mentioned to her friends how happy she was. Because of this, for Namiko to be having an affair and possibly getting killed by spouse finding out what she did seemed less likely. Satoru himself seemed to have a solid alibi and no reason has been found to point a finger at him or his connections. As the culprit's age seemed to be closer to that of Satoru, his previous relationships were investigated. Although Satoru had a previous marriage, his ex-wife had been living in Shizuoka Prefecture and had an alibi according to police. In addition, the ex-wife had allegedly been tested for her blood type and DNA, which showed no match as results showed she carried blood type O in contrast to the culprit's blood type B. Some speculated the ex-wife could have hired someone else to kill Namiko, though there seemed to be no bad blood between Satoru and his ex-wife. A last proposed motive revolves around a more random event in which the culprit was ultimately someone who wasn't known to the Takaba family. This would explain why the culprit hasn't been found up until now. Propositions vary from a random encounter in which the culprit was driven by jealousy of young mothers to a culprit who suffered from a mental illness. Especially the unaccounted two-hour time period between 9 and 11 a.m. seem to be important as Namiko could have encountered someone during these two hours. As brought up before, Koei had mentioned a woman who had killed his mother when he was three and four years old when he visited the crime scene. Koei's words about the supposed woman at the convenience store, while explored by police counselors, were not deemed as reliable, and years later didn't ring any bells for Koei as an adult. While the neighborhood may have changed, as of 2023, at least two convenience stores can be found in the vicinity of the former Quito Pediatric Clinic location. Question is, did Namiko run into trouble that morning in a convenience store, or is the testimony of a four-year-old child as unreliable as it is considered right now? An argument against the random attack is that the murder happened in the Takabas apartment. Namiko was known to be wary of salespeople, as she would have bad experiences in the past. According to Satoru, she would only on rare occasions forget to lock the door and wouldn't invite strangers into their house. If someone would knock on the front door, Namiko would always check through the kitchen window or the door's peephole, not opening the door if she wouldn't trust the situation. The door didn't show any signs of forced entry though, meaning it was possible Namiko trusted the situation initially. These observations point more towards an acquaintance of the Takaba family, rather than a random stranger. In contrast, some speculate Namiko had opened the door without thinking twice because she expected the delivery man to return. While other theories as a burglary or a kidnap attempt are proposed, no items had been taken from the house and Koei had been left behind at the crime scene unharmed. Some propose Namiko was attacked by someone who was targeting mothers, though in the end, the identity of the culprit and her motive are still a mystery. After the murder of his beloved wife, Satori took Koei and moved to his parents' home in Nagoya's Minato ward though returned to apartment 201 many times. On a cold December day, Satori scrubbed his wife's blood from the hallway floor, feeling heartbroken as to what happened, describing his feeling towards the crime scene as follows. I would stop by two or three times a week and think, I have to clean it up, though when I thought, let's start cleaning here today, I couldn't do it. I would sigh and stay at the scene for about an hour, thinking, let's try some other time. I would put everything back in its place, leave the apartment and head to work. Also saying, when I came here and picked things up little by little, 
I realized that Namiko must have cherished them, so I couldn't throw them away. In order to raise his son, he returned to his real estate job, hurt and angry, two months after Namiko's death. Though eventually, Satori realized that he couldn't move forward if he kept his anger, and decided to turn his life around and look ahead. While no one has lived in apartment 201 for more than two decades, Satori still pays 50,000 yen rent every month, exceeding total costs of over 20 million yen over the years. His motivation to keep the crime scene preserved stems from his belief that the culprit will be caught someday, as he believes keeping the crime scene intact might help find new clues. I want to bring the perpetrator to the crime scene someday, is what he said, adding, I don't want the incident to be forgotten for Koei's sake. While Satoru is in his late 60s as of 2023, the apartment has been the same as when the crime happened in 1999, even preserving the bloodstains and footprints at the entrance under a piece of plastic. The apartment has stopped in time, as Namiko's blood can still be noted in the living room's rug, Koei's toys still lay on the floor, and the calendar is left on November 1999. Still hanging over a chair in one of the tatami rooms is Namiko's red checkered jacket that she often wore over her pajamas. The tatami room at the end of the hallway shows a pile of mail functioning as an indicator of how many years the murder of Namiko has gone unsolved. The landlord and his wife who found Namiko allegedly passed away, though their son took over as landlord and keeps the rent low. Satori mentioned, I've been tempted to put everything away, although the rent is lower than before, the monthly rent burden of 50,000 yen is not light. I live on a pension and my income is limited. As time passed, he began to feel as if the culprit was no longer alive. So when he sees the bloodstains at the entrance of the apartment, he becomes motivated, saying, The proof is here, and I will never let it escape. Satori kept notebooks of the time the incident happened, as shown in the following picture. In the notebooks, he tried to write down the details of the case as not to forget any useful information, as seen on the following page. Another notation showed Satori even wrote down the name of the detective investigating the case. Detective Etoku Okabe was one of the investigators working on Namiko's case for seven years until March of 2018, after which he retired. Together with Detective Okabe, police mobilized over 90,000 investigators, though the case remains unsolved. これを受け今日西警察署では免許更新などに訪れた人にマスクの入ったチラシを配布し改めて情報提供を呼びかけました。in an interview, Detective Okabe mentioned, I think there's a lot of hidden information. If you can provide this information to the police, it might lead to the perpetrator. Please cooperate with us. While officers have requested the public to cooperate as much as possible, some have criticized police for not releasing information such as the uncensored sketch of the culprit sooner. The choice of temporarily stopping their investigation into the traces of blood around Eno Park has also been criticized, as the traces washed away by rain could have been the key to catch the culprit. Some online reactions mentioned DNA at the scene should have brought more results in this case, comparing the situation to the US where DNA databases seem to hold information of a larger amount of the population. A noticeable push towards using an investigative method called genetic genealogy is proposed online, a method using DNA testing combined with traditional genealogical research in order to find biological relationships between people. This way, officers have the opportunity to find relatives of someone who left DNA at the crime scene giving them extra leads to work with. Although Japan joined the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, according to its website, it speculated this method might be less effective due to the relative smaller database information in Japan to go on. For now, use of the method in US law enforcement has seen some significant results, as can be seen in the case of the Golden State Killer, 
though its use within police investigations has been within a gray area of the law, concerning privacy among others. Other replies suggest widespread government accessibility to DNA and fingerprints of all citizens, one saying, a controlled society benefits everyone except criminals. Another proposition proposes an increase of cameras in residential areas, so police have more evidence to go on. San Coe, probably the only eyewitness to the murder as a two-year-old boy, grew up only getting to know his mother through the photo album she left behind. Namiko had started keeping records of the family's special moments through multiple albums from the day Koei was born, which supports Satoru's statement of Namiko being very family-oriented. Namiko and her younger sister had been raised by a single mother after her parents' divorce. After graduating from high school in Nagoya, she'd been working at a manufacturing company for several years, after which she became a dentist's assistant. Then when she changed jobs to a real estate company, she met Satoru and longed for a normal family life. Traces of Namiko's life can still be found in the apartment, where she and Satoru moved into after their marriage in 1995, as records of Namiko's favorite artist, Seiko Matsuda, remain. Namiko and Satoru had already picked out the school Koei was planning to go to. It was said Namiko enjoyed watching baseball, and Namiko was excited to see Koei play at their team eventually. Unfortunately, Namiko was robbed of the time she was looking forward to. And while Satoru tried his best to give his son the best upbringing he could give as a single father, he mentioned being worried about raising a child without a mother. As a young boy, he would help his father by handing out flyers on the anniversary of Namiko's death, which Koei and his father still continue to do to this day. On the 13th of November, 2023, Satoru and Koei appealed to the public at Nagoya's Ion Mall in the Nishi Ward, together with police officers, members of the Sodano Kai, and two of Namiko's high school friends, now in their mid-fifties. The group handed out masks with on the back a flyer showing the portrait of the perpetrator. In an interview during the event, Satoru had said, When my late wife was alive, she was looking forward to seeing her son grow up. I want her to rest assured that my son is doing well in Tokyo right now. I hope we don't have to get her like this next year. I would like you to give any information, no matter how trivial, to the police. One person commenting on the case online mentioned the following. I remember it well because it happened near my parents' house and it happened when I was returning home to give birth for the first time. The child who was born at the time turned 20 years old the other day, and I feel the passage of time. Last year at a shopping center in a Nishi ward, I saw the husband and a friend trying to get information, and I know it's difficult, but I hope they resolve the issue. While Namiko would probably have wanted Koei to stay in Nagoya, Koei is pursuing his dreams of working in marketing in Tokyo, while his father continues to live in Nagoya. Koei had mentioned to his father, Namiko's remains had been in the Buddhist altar at the Takaba home, as to give her a chance to see Koei grow up. Though on the occasion of Koei's independence, Namiko's remains were placed in the grave where Satoru's father was buried. Satoru Takaba has been one of the members of the Soda no Kai, an organization that supports activities of bereaved family members of unsolved murder cases across Japan. As mentioned on the Soda no Kai's website, Satoru currently holds the position of representative secretary. He has worked alongside chairman Kenji Kobayashi, who lost his daughter Junko in an unsolved murder arson case, to bring attention to multiple unsolved cases. In 2010, the statute of limitation was abolished for certain murder cases due to the efforts of the Soda no Kai, which means the official investigation into Namiko's murder continues. Jiken kara 11 ga tatta, Heisei 22 nen. 
法律が改正され殺人事件などの時効は撤廃されましたこういった場面にですね一緒に立ち会えたことは本当にあの良かったと思っておりますまああの今夜はまあ少しこの喜びに浸ってですね明日からまた犯人を捕まえるように頑張りたいと思います。どうもありがとうございました。In his role as representative for the Sodano Kai, Satoru has spoken about his view on crime, saying, Crime cannot be eradicated. Rather than creating a society without crime, we need to create a society where people can live with peace of mind even if crime happens. Since Namiko's death, Nomori's TV shows, newspaper articles, news segments, and books have spent their efforts bringing attention to this case, which as of 2021 resulted in 110 pieces of information. Though despite all the attention, the case remains unsolved to this day. Satoru has mentioned it has been difficult because they don't know who the culprit is, which makes it hard for him to deal with his emotions surrounding the case. He also mentioned, I don't know the motive of the culprit at all. Why was it Namiko? That's what I want to know. Adding, I want the killer to be caught before I die. While the statute of limitations of the investigation has been abolished, Satoru fears the killer may die before seeing the consequences of our actions. Saying, I want to know something that only the perpetrator can know. What happened that day? Why did this happen? I want to know the truth. Satoru still wears his wedding ring in memory of Namiko, saying Namiko probably would have wanted for him and Koei to live fulfilling lives. While Satoru and Koei slowly tried rebuilding their lives after Namiko's death, their former home remains as if time seemed to have stopped. Although Namiko seemed to have never been happier in the period before her death, the bloodstains left behind in apartment 201. Remain to tell the heartbreaking events that took place on that fateful Saturday, the 13th of November, 1999. May Satoru and Koei find the information they're looking for, in order for the case to be solved after all these years, and may Namiko Takaba rest in peace. If anyone watching has information concerning the murder case of Namiko Takaba, please share your information. Through the following channels. <laughs>